Before we left Andre Harrell house, Puff told me I didn't have to go. I knew that somebody was gonna die that night. If it comes to getting ugly where somebody's gonna be trying to k me, I had a gun in my lap. Black Rob just got discharged from the hospital. The way the world tends to it and cares, it's overwhelming to see how many people care about our legends. Andre was writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book before he died. Kim Porter was working on a book. During the period when artists associated with Bad Boy Records met untimely deaths following conflicts or departures from the label, a phenomenon dubbed the Bad Boy Curse emerged. This curse was attributed to Diddy, the label's founder, as it was believed that individuals who clashed with him often met tragic fates. Initially dismissed as speculation, the narrative gained traction as evidence surfaced, revealing the last words of these artists often implicated Diddy or the record label. So let's get started to know what these artists had said about their their records or the executive behind them. Let's get started with Biggie's M. Many people believe that it is possible that Diddy was himself involved in Biggie's M. That is why he tried to hide the footage. Diddy's rumored fixation on obtaining a death row chain reached the point where it resembled a personal obsession or a highly coveted prize. He seemed to approach it as a game, enticing his associates with rewards for retrieving these chains for Bad Boy. Within the realm of gang culture, these chains carried out significant symbolic value, a fact Diddy was keenly aware of. Unfortunately, his relentless pursuit of these chains played a role in the tragic deaths of both Biggie and Tupac underscoring the grim consequences of his singular focus. In the extensive half-century history of hip-hop, no other pair of icons has undergone such thorough scrutiny of their lives and untimely demise as Tupac Shakur and Christopher Wallace, the renowned rapper professionally known as the Notorious B.I.G. or Biggie Smalls. Nearly three decades since their tragic and premature passes, Shakur in September 96 in Las Vegas and Wallace in March 97 in Los Angeles, both figures continue to occupy Occupy a special place in the hearts of fans, with their absence still profoundly felt. My closest friends did me in. My mm -hmm. closest friends, my homies, people who I done took care of their whole family. I done took care of everything for them, looked out for them, put them in the game, everything turned on me. If you was to get shot five times, mine is just completely spinning, you know what I'm saying? You're real confused about your situation. A notable link can be observed even in the investigations into their deaths. Greg Kading, a former detective with the Los Angeles Police Department, conducted an interview with Davis in 2009, identifying him as a person of interest in the Wallace M case. This interest was sparked by Davis's attendance at a party held at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, which Wallace had left shortly before encountering his tragic demise in a fatal shooting. One of the biggest celebrity crimes is the murder of rap legend Biggie Smalls, aka Notorious B.I.G., still unsolved 24 years later. A critical turning point unfolded when Valletta Wallace, the mother of Biggie Smalls, initiated a lawsuit against the LAPD, seeking approximately $500 million in damages. She referenced the widely known conspiracy theory that suggested the police had concealed the truth about her son's death. This legal action triggered the reopening of the case in 06, with LAPD detective Greg Kading appointed to spearhead the investigation. As Kading delved into the case, he unexpectedly unearthed a wealth of additional information. So we knew that he was somebody who was dangerous, somebody capable of doing these things, but we didn't know it was him until this until the other co-conspirator confesses. Detective Greg Kading made a significant revelation during his investigation, expressing his belief that the deaths of the notorious B.I.G. and Tupac were intricately linked. While delving into the circumstances surrounding Biggie's tragic demise, he unearthed new evidence that established a connection between both cases. The time that Biggie Smalls was killed, Suge Knight was in the county jail. So in order for him to communicate with somebody on the street, he had to go through an intermediary. Gene Deal has disclosed that Diddy was profiting from Biggie and the late rapper had plans to depart the record label weeks before his tragic M. During an appearance on DJ Vlad's vlog, Deal asserted that the rapper was making moves to leave Bad Boy for a lucrative deal exceeding $60 million. According to Deal, he had a glimpse of Biggie's Bad Boy contract when tasked with overseeing Diddy's briefcase during a flight. The contract detailed Biggie's earnings in increments of $250,000 with publishing income remaining in Puff's possession. 
Upon questioning Biggie about it, the rapper purportedly shared details about a new deal and the substantial income it would bring. And I seen Big contract. I think the contract was for so many years for like 62 million, it comes out to like 62 million dollars. But Gene's claims may be hard to verify, they are heavily backed by Biggie's mother, Valletta Wallace, who once discussed how much money he received when he signed on with the label. She wrote about it in her 2005 book, Biggie. Valletta Wallace remembers her son Christopher, saying, quote, the truth is Christopher accepted the illusion of a friend and mentor for about $25,000. That's the amount Puffy lured my son with. That was a lot of money for Christopher back then as a 19-year-old. He had never seen that much at one time in his life. It was enough money to make my son believe that Puffy was ready to do anything for him. It was enough to buy a blind love and loyalty. In his interview with DJ Vlad, Gene also discussed Diddy's focus on making money above all else. According to Deal, Diddy allegedly expressed a lack of concern about the potential deaths of Tupac and Biggie months before their tragic incident. Deal recounted a situation after the Soul Train Awards where Diddy became upset upon overhearing him telling other bodyguards that he had run from death row. Deal claimed that Diddy emphasized his priority as a businessman, prioritizing financial success. Following these remarks, Deal asserted that Diddy seemingly foreshadowed future events by stating he didn't care about the potential deaths of Biggie or Tupac, or whether Suge Knight got incarcerated. These statements, if accurate, shed light on a controversial perspective of Diddy's mindset during that period. He said, I'm a businessman. I don't give a f if Pac got to die, Big got to die, or Suge Knight go to jail. Something's got to change. In the continuation of the interview, Gene further disclosed that the individual responsible for shooting Biggie had allegedly approached Diddy before the M occurred. Additionally, he challenged the accuracy of the well-known sketch depicting Biggie's alleged K, asserting that it did not faithfully represent the actual perpetrator. According to Gene, the police possessed surveillance photos of a man fitting the description provided by eyewitnesses on the night of the shooting. However, these photos have reportedly never been released to the public. Does the police sketch look like the person that you saw? No. I told him that. I said the bone structure was a little higher. He had everything right, the blue suit, the white shirt, the blue bow tie, the whole nine yards. Diddy has addressed Biggie's death in an interview with Wendy Williams, expressing a sense of responsibility for the passing of his then 24-year-old friend. In that same interview, he recounted the details of the night of Biggie's death, emphasizing that the original plan was for both of them to be on a plane leaving the country. Do you ever feel responsible in any way, mm. in any way? I think I always feel some sort of responsibility because I'm, I'm in this thing with him, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He's my artist. Diddy's assertions that Biggie wanted to stay in Los Angeles were contradicted by Kirk Burroughs, the former president of Bad Boy Records. According to Burroughs, it was actually Diddy who insisted on remaining in LA instead of proceeding with their original plan to go to London. Diddy called early Saturday morning saying, He's not going to London. You go. You represent it. You go. He wants to stay here in L.A. Gene's claims regarding Diddy's involvement in Biggie's death have indeed sparked attention and discussion. The consistency in Gene's account of the events leading to Biggie's tragic demise has resonated with fans, serving as an intriguing aspect in the ongoing dialogue surrounding the circumstances of the rapper's death. Stories never changed after all these years. This man is telling the truth, one fan wrote. Quote, I'm glad Gene exposing these truths, Big and Puff wasn't as tight as Puff made them out to be. The relationship was CEO and artist, that's it, a second fan added. The various theories surrounding Biggie's untimely death, while not officially verified, consistently implicate Diddy's involvement. Then he was claimed to plan a hit on Craig Mack. Hip-hop star Craig was the inaugural artist to release an album under P. Diddy's Bad Boy Records. Their encounter unfolded outside the renowned New York nightclub Mecca, where Craig serendipitously crossed paths with Sean Combs, then known as Puff Daddy. Seizing the moment, Craig performed a rap for Combs, who was duly impressed. This led to Craig's inclusion on a remix of Mary J. Blige's You Don't Have to Worry, paving the way for Combs to extend a recording contract offer to him. Don't try to play me for that same, same, same. The rift between Craig and Diddy emerged over financial disagreements concerning their album. Sources reveal that Craig felt shortchanged, alleging he hadn't received payment from Diddy and Biggie. In candid accounts, Craig disclosed the details of his strained relationship with Diddy. He claimed to have agreed to contribute songs to Diddy's projects with the understanding that he would receive one-third of the revenue. However, as Craig continued his work, the promised compensation failed to materialize. Eventually growing frustrated with the situation, Craig ceased working for Diddy altogether, marking a turning point in their relationship. I gotta be a, you know, an idiot and sit here and 
do all this stuff for everybody, and I'm not going to see anything from it. Craig also recounted how Biggie and Diddy joined forces against him, seemingly taunting him for his decision to distance himself from their partnership. Craig, unwilling to stay silent in the face of what he perceived as unjust accusations, was adamant about setting the record straight and refuting any falsehoods directed towards him. Buff didn't like him for whatever reason he didn't. He told Craig, yo, if you don't fire your manager, you can't work for bad boy. The fallout between Craig and Diddy didn't simply dissipate, instead it spiraled into a deeply unpleasant situation, marked by numerous criminal activities. Craig revealed that he faced threats from Diddy's associates who would stalk him and issue menacing warnings. Craig courageously condemned Diddy's tactics, describing them as emblematic of a bullying mafia mentality. You know, with this, with this, this bullish mafia mentality with him and his goons and all that stuff like that, you know, talking about, yo, you know, you owe us an album. As Craig persisted in his stance, Diddy escalated the conflict to a more ominous level by issuing explicit death threats. The feud intensified to such an extent that Craig genuinely feared for his life. In an emotional interview, he revealed the constant weight of the death threat hanging over him. Craig did not shy away from asserting that Diddy had orchestrated a plan to have him caged. They were going to do something to me, but they didn't. This might be the reason that Craig was scared for his life. He knew Diddy was capable of K-ing him. He had even admitted to carrying weapons at all times for the purpose of self-defense if the need arose. But if it comes to getting ugly where somebody's gonna be trying to k me, I had a gun in my lap. And it was around this time that Craig resorted to God. He became strictly religious and even left his album mid-production and went underground. I broke down, started crying all over the place in the car. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was thinking about trying to do this to somebody because it was really in my heart. The he remained away from public scrutiny for a good couple of years. Fans appreciated this gesture because it appeared so, that he had decided to leave music and devote his life to religion. One fan commented, quote, all the evil in the industry drove him to God. Another added, regardless of the weird guy and weird cult, I believe Craig Mack's relationship with God was personal and genuine, and that's all that matters. This statement alludes to a crucial aspect that warrants further exploration, Craig's involvement with a dubious church organization. He found himself ensnared in a murky cult teetering on the brink of collapse, led by a figure described by one pastor as akin to a dog and labeled by a victim as Satan in the flesh. This individual is none other than Ralph Gordon Stair. New tonight, a woman who says she was victimized at a Walterboro church wants her voice heard. Pastor Ralph Stair charged and convicted of various crimes. An investigation has unveiled a disturbing array of allegations against Ralph Gordon Stair, the leader of Overcomers Church. Through interviews with former members and a comprehensive examination of court records spanning decades, it has come to light that the self-proclaimed prophet, 84-year-old Stair, is a serial s alleged rapist and pedophile. Shockingly, he has been accused of infecting his victims with a transmitted disease and even providing instructions to one young woman on inducing a miscarriage when she feared she was pregnant with his child. These horrifying revelations barely scratch the surface of Stair's offenses, as it appears he wielded considerable influence over Craig and others, coercing them into his web of abuse. Craig's experience is not unique. Another victim has come forward with a similar harrowing tale of entrapment within the cult, enduring seven years of manipulation and exploitation. I was trap at 17 and then I jumped into the ministry because I wanted to give my life to God and then I jumped into a cult unknowingly and couldn't leave for seven years. Unfortunately, Craig wasn't lucky enough to come out of this cult alive and in bizarre turn of events, he died of heart failure in 2018, aged just 46. After this, the death of Black Rob also caused frenzy among the netizens. Rob's distinctive style was a fusion of raw energy and deeply personal narratives creating a unique blend where his husky barren voice intertwined with emotive storytelling elements. Rob continued his journey and released another album titled Game Tested Streets Approved in 2011, asserting his independence from Diddy and his former label. Unfortunately, this album didn't attain the same sales and attention as his earlier works. Black Rob's journey within the label was not devoid of challenges. In 2006, he faced incarceration due to a robbery charge. During his time in prison, Bad Boy Records reportedly removed him from their website and offered limited financial and emotional emotional support. Despite being a featured artist on Bad Boys for Life, from Puff's 2001 album The Saga Continues, Black Rob came to realize that the famous line from his boss, don't worry if I write rhymes, I write checks, came with certain conditions. It's always a shock to me. Good. You know what I'm saying? When, when, when he said, you know, that was down with, that down with Bad Boys, I said, what? 
So I went to his house. I went to his house and got him. And he said, yeah, I'm down. He channeled his heart and soul into his music, reflecting his life's challenges and his resolve to rise above the turmoil that surrounded him. However, his triumphs were often fleeting. And like numerous other rappers, legal troubles hindered his career's progress. A tragic turn came when Black Rob suffered a stroke, significantly affecting his health and overall well-being. I mean, I've been dealing with this man for five years. Damn. Four strokes. Despite his utmost efforts, he struggled to replicate the massive success of Life's story. Regrettably, his health deteriorated further and he encountered multiple obstacles on his journey. Tragically, his battle came to an end when he suffered a cardiac arrest on April 17, 2021 at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. Black Rob passed away at the age of 52, leaving a legacy of his contributions to the hip-hop world. Black Rob's presence played a pivotal role in documenting the evolution of Bad Boy Records both before and after Biggie. It's truly challenging to accept that he didn't receive the recognition he deserved while he was alive. Only after his passing did people truly grasp the significance of his legacy and the impact he made on the hip-hop world. However, his sudden death while being related to Diddy caused a stir in social media and according to past evidence, Hollywood is allegedly involved in getting rid of their non-favorite artists by inducing them to some specific D's which cause heart strokes. Moreover, Diddy also has his name in the demise of Andre Harrell. According to some sources, Andre was writing a book and exposing everything. It's revealed that Kim Porter, Diddy's wife, was collaborating on this book with Al Shore, Andre, and Heavy D. Their collective narrative aimed to share something enigmatic and shared in their lives. To gain further insights, Jaguar, one of the contributors to the book, is poised to reveal more about the undisclosed aspects of Kim Porter's life and the common threads tying these individuals together. Andre was writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book before he died. Kim Porter was working on a book. It's been reported that Andre became suspicious upon detecting toxins in her body and confronted Diddy directly about their origin. Many believe these substances could be key evidence in establishing Diddy's involvement. Andre, being well-versed in the industry, harbored doubts about the sudden nature of Kim's death and raised questions about the presence of toxins with Diddy. His inquiry is significant given his insider knowledge of the entertainment world. Furthermore, rumors suggest that Diddy's anger upon learning that Andre was aiding Kim Porter with her tell-all book may have stemmed from fear of damaging revelations. Now, another thing that was told to me is that Diddy and Andre actually got into an argument back in 2000. 2017, Andre was helping and assisting Kim with writing her tell-all book. The potential contents of the unpublished book shed light on a darker and more complex dimension of many alleged dark things that are related to Diddy. All of this evidence made people suggest that Diddy has somehow had his hands in the demise of his own artists.